Yes, so let's go into our key issue of this morning, which are the challenges and options for democracy. You have different perspectives, you have different experiences, and we will do three rounds, three rounds of question and answers here on the panel. And I have said we have limited time, so the answers shouldn't be more than two, three minutes. And then also we will have, ho hopefully, uh, a lot of opportunity for interaction with you. But let's start with the first question. Which are the main challenges to democracy in your view? Janina, you have the first floor. Thank you, Bruno. It's my real pleasure to be here. I, I remember I was the first time in Arau in 2008, so I'm coming back after a long time. Um, yeah, we have a quite challenging question, and I have decided to focus on, on three levels, because we promise to be short, uh, which I consider are absolutely relevant to understand the challenges democracies are facing nowadays. And the first is at the level of the outcomes, and I would characterize that, that with three um, words, inequalities, uncertainty, and unfairness. And I think there are many more problems related to the outcomes, the global system of governance and the state nation uh, is providing, but these three to somehow explain a lot the crisis uh, of democracy nowadays. Inequalities, because there is a growing incidence of inequalities, and this uh, is perceived as uh, unfair. So people feel uncertainty regarding the future, and the unfairness of this model also feeds some of the bad solutions to these challenges democracies are facing. That's why I consider this absolutely relevant. The second level is the level of decision making. And probably we will talk a lot about that today, tomorrow, and the following days. We are talking a lot about that. And I think there is a misunderstanding when talking about political parties, because it looks like political parties by default are like bad, and bad people is leading political parties. And I think representation is much more than electoral representation. We have many more leaderships in civil society. This is quite fundamental. And the reason why political parties are not working well is related to the incentives in the decision-making process. Switzerland, to somehow, is a different model. But when I think in Latin American countries, but also in many European countries, like Spain or Italy or France, Political parties have strong incentives to access to power and to keep power. And in doing so, they treat the adversaries as enemies, and this doesn't produce the basic conditions for a collective governance and for looking for good solutions. When parties are in the opposition, they are against whatever the government is doing and the opposite. And this is highly problematic. And the third, and this is a kind of provocation also, is on the level of the solutions provided. One part, I think we all agree, is uh, incarnate by the authoritarian leadership, the far right, the populist extreme options, which are fed by this uncertainty, by these bad feelings, and the bad perception of, on, on how the decision-making system is, is working. But I. I am also worried about some of the solutions which are pro offered as magic solutions on the level of participatory democracy. I'm convinced of the importance of direct democracy and participatory democracy, but I also have to say, and with this I close because I know we are short in time, uh, participatory democracy is also a claim in China or in Russia. So it's not only about citizen participation. The Soviet regime, the totalitarian regimes, were highly participatory. So it's not only about participation, it's which kind of participation. And we need much more reflection on how to include whatever we consider relevant to feed a better debate in a real democratic system at, at these three levels. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this last note about participatory autocracy is really one of the big challenges uh, we have especially to discuss in this kind also of, of forum. So, uh, Simon. 
First of all, thank you so much, uh, Bruno, for having me on this panel today. It's uh, great that my division, the Peace and Human Rights Division of the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, is a partner of this year's Global Forum. Let me start with a positive message here. I'm optimistic about democracy. Democracy functions, it delivers, it can self-correct. Studies show that there is a positive correlation between democracy on the one hand and peace, development and innovation on the other hand. Millions across the globe, especially in non-democratic countries, demand more participation, more political influence, more freedom, respect for their rights and more accountability from their leaders. But yes, of course, there are challenges and we are here to talk about the challenges first and foremost. On the macro level, I see two main challenges, an internal one and an external one. First, the internal one. Democracies are facing worrisome trends of weakening support for the institutions and increasing dissatisfaction of the citizens with democracy itself. Citizens have less trust in the institutions. These trends are sometimes fomented by digitalization and by social media. Digitalization can shrink the democratic space through surveillance and it can also worsen polarization. It can undermine democracy and it's often used precisely to that end. Some democracies, we see this across the globe, erode from within and the data clearly show a decline of the quality of democracy in democracies. Many in democracies have become complacent. Democracy is seen as a given or sometimes even as a burden. And it has also become fashionable in democracies to talk bad about democracy, go to a, a bookstore and look for books about democracy. 99% of the books will have a quite negative tone about what democracy is and the 1% uh, that is more positive, that will be the books that will not be sold very well uh, because it's not in the overall mood that we are, seem to be in. Now briefly about the external challenge, there can be no doubt that we find ourselves in a global democratic recession. Freedom House data show that 2021 was the 16th consecutive year of decline of democratic freedoms. Today, two-thirds of the world's population live in autocracies. Small bracket here. Obviously, this dichotomy between democracy and autocracy is an oversimplification. We all know that there are a lot of shades of grey between these two uh, poles, in a way, and we would also have to define exactly what we mean when we talk about democracy and when we talk about autocracy. But for sake of time, we, we use this, this dichotomy probably also throughout the discussion today. Autocracies have become much more aggressive in shutting down the democratic space and in their repression. The example of Russia is telling where we see the interlinkage between democratic re repression and the complete closing of the democratic space on the one hand and the brutal war against a neighboring country on the other hand. Autocracies also try to undermine democracies through so-called sharp power. And it must be said, however, that this outside pressure on democracies are only effective or are mainly effective when democracies are weakened from within. And that's unfortunately the case in many democracies. Thank you. Yes, uh, you started with a very optimistic note. Democracy by the many, autocracy by the few but if you have quite to say just now. So, uh, Linda, uh, in uh, your perspective, which are the main challenges to democracy today? Well, thank you first and foremost for inviting me and hello everybody, good morning. Nice to see that you all made it up early. Um, well, to me it's pretty obvious that the biggest challenge that we have to face is the climate crisis and the era of poly crisis that we live in, meaning that there's so many several, there's so many different huge crises that don't only exist parallel and next to each other, but they multiply each other. And democracy has to prove itself as a good and actually the best way to solve these problems. 
otherwise, if it can't prove itself, we stand in front of a huge problem. And I believe that this, this huge challenge that we have to face with democracies needs three core elements in, able to, in, in order to be able to, to make the way through this and to actually prove itself as uh, the best form of government. And these three elements that I see are legitimacy, capability to act, and re resilience. Because why these three? I believe that we need fair, effective, and long-lasting solutions to the crises that we're facing. And legitimacy is able to give fairness, the capability to act, so enlightenment in a way. Having an enlightened society gives the effectiveness. And then the resilience, on the other hand, so having a sense of belonging and togetherness of the society makes it long-lasting. And I think these are the three core elements that we have to work towards in order to be able to face the challenge and make democracy the foundation that we can build the future on. Thank you. I think you already entered a little bit the second round, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's very, very valid because we want to talk mainly about solutions and way forwards. But uh, chung -ok. Yeah, I will say good morning and uh, good afternoon and good evening because uh, we are, though we are separated by time zone and the space, our will to democratize democracy created it this playground to run together. So uh, I really feel at home to be here in Lutheran City, uh, naturally, culturally, and politically blessed, and especially hosting this meaningful global forum. So I know for from 2008, when this kind of a global forum has uh, existed, a lot of sweat, passion, and the contribution, and the intellectual wisdom uh, should be called together. So in that sense, uh, uh, in spite of COVID-19's uh, interference, but we came together. So in that sense, uh, in this way, I really feel uh, encouraged and uh, try to be very <laughs> optimistic in certain way. Though, but I will turn, because my question is what is the challenges? I will go to, into the dark side. So the challenges of current democracy, in my opinion, is <laughs> may, you may see the skid game uh, in Netflix. <laughs> so I, I thought uh, skid game style game of election of representative democracy. It seemingly winner takes all game, but this kind of game finally has embarked in self-destruction of a winner himself or herself because of the, uh, the ground has already collapsed. So uneven distribution of power and resources between the elected and the electing drives the election as life and death game which mobilize all the resources. So the post stress, fake news, and anti-intellectualism, uh, and the confirmation bias has deconstructed over underlying common ground value and the mutual trust. So I think it is the, uh, one of the serious challenges we are faced now. So, Uneven distribution of power and information has uh, mismatched with the uneven distribution of responsibility and uh, uneven distribution of citizenship. So sometimes uh, uh, those who <laughs> those we are those who here they are overburdened with their moral citizenship, but. Uh, most of the others, they sometimes enjoy their free riding uh, situations. So, uh, so civic space has been encroached by consumerism uh, and uh, efficiency orientation and uh, dichotomization. So media has become the tool of commerce. The ownership of Fox, Fox News and the CNN 
is the same. <laughs> you, 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 do you know? So the political opinion difference is not the matter. So who gets more attention has become the key criteria. So uh, in, in this situation, so, so the main challenges of modern democracy, I thought, the deformation of representation democracy. So, so we came together to sustain democracy with a, a strong push forward direct decision making process and to try to make a more even distribution of uh, right and responsibility and the more even distribution of citizenship sharing burden. So that was my <laughs> opinion. So again, I give my deep thanks to make me <laughs> share my, my thought and my uh, idea uh, to all of the like-minded like people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jong uh, Ok, for this, uh, uh, let's say, concluding list of challenges and problems. And of course, uh, we feel we're really deep down in the pool just now. But um, at the same time, we see uh, the blue sky uh, outside and we see all of you. So we have a lot of reason for uh, not being too depressed. Uh, and we are, for that reason now, going to our second question, which is, uh, yes. What are the possible solutions and improvements to protect and strengthen democracy? And uh, yes, Chongok, you can continue. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I really have in mind the, the possible. So there are many solutions, but the, the possibility is the key for me to answer. So I am a very faithful student of a global forum uh, because uh, in Korea we are uh, to to get democratic system, whether it is superficial or not, uh, uh, it costs life deaths. So in that sense, uh, after uh, restoring some procedural democracy, we don't know where to go. So at that time, I met Bruno Kaufmann in Taiwan. <laughs> so I thought that direct democracy is a way to, go, way to go forward. So global forum is the really uh, the viable school, democratic school for me in every sense. So strengthening global forum is the possible solution. <laughs> so I, I, I was not asked by anybody, <laughs> but uh, because it is a very, very mutual learning process. It is a very uh, a paradigm shift of education because usually democratic education for the young people, they felt it very boring. But uh, I saw the omnibus experiment and uh, this kind of, uh, this global forum uh, named after festival. So uh, for even for the young people, it's quite attractive and uh, gives some fun. So uh, in this sense, uh, new type of democracy uh, education. And also it has created many internists. So, so crossing the border between the professionalism and the ordinary citizens and uh, all different sectors uh, coming put together, and uh, it can make a collective wisdom and the collective synergy uh, to understand the situation of democracy in a more uh, totalistic way. So, so one one very possible solution to strengthen global forum and extend the participation is the uh, improve for the improvement of democracy. Uh, so, uh, I did uh, some practice in Korea, so wherever there is a uh, small spaces and resources, I practiced uh, to find uh, a way forward uh, direct democracy. So I organized uh, youth academy, youth political academy. So. Uh, 250 students were recommended by the, uh, by the sometimes local government, seniors and the teachers. 
And uh, at first, I found it is very difficult for them to vote for the propositions and the policy, because usually it was get used to, to election is related with the personnel. So, uh, so, uh, so combined with the United States project citizen uh, approach and the uh, uh, direct democracy module, so I ask them first to find the social problems <laughs> and uh, let them try to set up certain uh, initiatives and proposals and uh, uh, among themselves they have voted for which initiatives should be go to referendum and uh, finally they selected certain initiatives and then uh, go to referendum and it is exercise actually but the uh, local government leaders uh, understand our uh, new experiment and uh, those proposals which have passed the referendum were more than 90% were accepted by no local government. So in that sense, they try to make a certain a little, little, little space to, uh, uh, to use, uh, uh, to exercise a direct democracy. That, that was uh, my suggestion. Another is uh, related to the big issue, the so energy issue. So, uh, huge debate on the, whether the, the nuclear uh, plant should be rebuilt or not. So that was the hot issue uh, within the Korea. So our, gov our government tried to uh, adopt a deliberate process. So we, we organized a deliberative committee uh, to deal with the issue. But uh, Finally, we have decided this. Uh, the, 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 the decided this uh, uh, issue with the deliberation. But the problem I found is that uh, those kind of deliberation process, because it is uh, uh, energy issue, the uh, terminology th th term is just so highly uh, techno technocratic. So it is very difficult for the ordinary citizens to be part of that and the uh, uneven distribution of uh, professional knowledge was the, uh, the problem also. So, but anyway, uh, within the limited framework, uh, we, 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 we have tried to uh, use uh, the more transparent and open and the direct way of decision-making pro uh, process uh, practices is, uh, is very important, I thought. It is the kind of democratic citizenship education. So strengthening democratic citizens, citizenship education by practicing is the some kind of a way out. So that thank is. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Um, I also remember uh, <coughs> that you have uh, worked very much with spaces, infrastructure for democracy in very difficult situation. When we had the Global Forum in uh, Korea 2009, we visited the peace village in the demilitarized uh, zone between uh, South and North Korea, which you have been very active. I still remember these meetings with the people there at the river between North and South as a very uh, impressive way of trying to overcome this kind of impossibility of living together. Now, Linda, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Um, well, as I said before, there are three core elements that I believe are the challenges to actually ensure them, legitimacy, capacity, or capability and responsibility. And there are all different sorts of ways of solutions, how we can strengthen them. And I think you are the most important part of it, or people are. And uh, with legi legitimacy, um, I see two main aspects that at least we also in the foundation try to foster, and that's uh, to make people able and willing to participate. So meaning that they need to have access to the processes and they need to be willing. So what we can do to strengthen that are, as you also said, uh, deliberative new formats or more democracy education, which especially in Switzerland is not the best, and uh, have also inclusive policies, because I don't know if you know it, but in Switzerland, 25% of the people who live here are not entitled to vote because they don't have a passport. Um, so this is one way to strengthen legitimacy. Then we have the capability to act. And this, as I said, needs informed citizens and a 
people believing in enlightenment, in science. And in order to strengthen that, I think solutions are to strengthen media literacy, to strengthen local media, especially in federalized states as uh, Switzerland, and to foster science, to give science the place in policies that it needs to have, especially in the light of the crises we're in. And then we have the responsibility and, uh, re sorry, the um, resilience. And the resilience is based on the sense of togetherness, as I said before, and I think there we also have all different sorts of projects, probably also present here today, that try to not only foster this sense of being a community or a team or taking responsibility for others, but that also try to think about new ways of the democracies we're going to live in. And I feel that there, and I'm going to come to that later, we need to nudge a little bit more for creativity, for imagination, for utopias. Thank you very much. <clears throat> really, uh, you can say you have a list uh, where to go, and it will be very interesting to talk about how to go there. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Um, despite of the worldwide democratic recession we have briefly talked about, and I have said this before, the global demand for democracy remains very high. Time and again, the drive for democracy and also for direct democracy comes from grassroots movements, and it is anchored in local initiatives. I have served in Poland, I have served in Romania, and uh, I remember very well having discussions with young people, very dedicated young people, who want more democracy, who want to build up a new participatory, deliberate democracy, a deliberative democracy. I felt this very strongly, and this is where the, the drive comes from. It doesn't come from governments, it comes from, from the grassroots. However, governments can and should play a certain role. In a recent survey, over 90% of the Swiss uh, people said they consider it very important or important to promote democracy abroad and to promote human rights. Democracy appears to be somehow in the political DNA of the Swiss people. Obviously, we would have to discuss what Swiss people means and um, what, what democracy means, but still, I mean, it's, it's 90%. And so the message about the importance of democracy at home and abroad is, is very clear. And we have Article 54 of the Swiss Constitution. And Article 54 of the Swiss Constitution says that the Confederation has to promote democracy abroad. It's a constitutional mandate. So how do we do this? I give you four examples of what we are doing, and I think we pick up on some of these elements in the last round of uh, our discussion here. First, we try to promote decentralization, local participation and local good governments, and the capacity building support to civil society is very important. This is done mainly by the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation, but there are also other parts of the government, my division included, which are active in this field. Second. A lot of good work has been done by experts helping to design constitutional frameworks in fragmented multicultural societies and countries taking into consideration and adapting the Swiss model of federalism and power sharing. Third element is our participation in election observation missions. Switzerland is very active, observation missions of the European Union, of the OSCE, but also of the Amer Organization of American States. And we do have contributions, concrete contributions to electoral integrity managed by my division. And force, and that's also very key, and sometimes we forget that this is part of, of democracy and democracy promotion, it's our human rights diplomacy. We focus a lot, when we talk about human rights, we focus a lot on freedom of expression, free media, and protection of minorities, and these are obviously key ingredients of democracy. Thank you very much. Um, you have a strong mandate, obviously. Uh, I mean, uh, Switzerland is the only country where there is an obligation in the Constitution to uh, support democracy globally. That's, we voted about that. <laughs> In 1999, uh, and also what you said that there is such a, a strong, uh, a strong uh, approval 
of that. That's, of course, uh, very, very welcome. Yanni, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I will connect the solutions to the problems I identified before. I spoke about inequalities, and now Linda, in the first round, spoke about clim climate change. I think there are some key challenges which uh, require more global governance. It's, it's not possible to deal with uh, climate change, for instance, from a nation state. And even, I would say, it's not possible to deal with it from a supranational level like the European Union. Now there is a huge debate on what means the green transition at the level of the European Union for the countries of the Global South, where the lithium and other rare metals are extracted, having an impact on social life and conditions, etc., in the countries of the South. So I think this is a really big challenge, which requires more democratic global governance, we are facing a war now, so we know this is really difficult, but there is a path on that and should be much more should be invested on that. Uh, and the same for taxa taxation, etc. Uh, then I spoke about the decision making uh, process and I spoke about political parties. Here we are in Switzerland. I think context matters a lot, and then we should go in details and see what happens in different countries. The challenges in Switzerland, I think, are quite clear, some at least. Uh, yesterday, um, Salvina Nabel spoke about uh, abstention. This is a huge problem. Now you spoke about uh, the, the amount of people who is excluded because are uh, not born in Switzerland, or many are born in Switzerland, but don't have the nationality. So this is a huge problem. In other countries with more like typical representative democratic systems, I think more direct democracy should be a really good investment. I, I'm quite f not fan, but I support the Swiss model. I like the mandatory referendum and the popular initiative, I think are a great contribution. Uh, and this could be combined with other instruments like sorted assemblies to improve the quality of the public debate. So we, we have many instruments and it requires more, more political will to really introduce that, legislate and allow the, the activation. And finally, shortly, I also want to mention the um, community building. In Swiss Info with Bruno, we were working on participatory budgeting on the series. And, and I think this is uh, the participatory budgeting and other instruments at the local level are not really powerful at the level of decision making. This is quite clear, but could be really powerful at the level of producing social cohesion and building community or reinforcing the community. And we need that to build democracy from, from, from the grassroots. So I think this is absolutely fundamental too. Thank you very much. Uh, as you said now and completed this picture of, uh, let's say, solutions to all these problems, it's really also, again, it's a, it's a global democracy issue. It's, it doesn't mean that democracy is just global, but there are a, a global approach to many different ideas, many different experiences, and we can le learn from each another. And that's really also the idea, of course, of this forum. So, I would like to conclude this, uh, uh, this round of, uh, let's say, statements, introductions, sharings before we enter a more global discussion uh, uh, with very concrete uh, ideas how we can best support and develop democracy. Maybe, I mean, all of you are part of platforms, of institutions, of experiences, of resources also, how to, how to promote, how to uh, in, in, in make democracy more democratic in different ways. And uh, I would like to start uh, with, uh, as we said before, a strong mandate, a strong approval. So what does, what, what do you do, Simon, to make democracy more democratic? Yeah, thank you, Bruno. I uh, mentioned already four examples uh, before uh, to show you a bit what we are doing uh, very concretely. I think the starting point must be that we, we understand, and you all understand this very well, that democracy obviously is a, is a complex system with many interlinked elements and institutions. Elections, obviously, but participation, access to justice, 
media integrity, human rights, you name it. Um, in order to strengthen all these aspects of democracy, we increasingly need to bring in different types of actors and maybe also new types of actors. For example, the private sector. Uh, strong partnerships are also crucial to move forward in, 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 in going beyond fighting the symptoms of democratic recession in a more defensive way to a more positive engagement. And I think it has been mentioned before, for us, a key word is really this democratic resilience. How can we build up this democratic resilience here in Switzerland, but also uh, worldwide? Um, and that's particularly important when it comes to backsliding democracies or emerging democracies. How can we work together with them? And it must be, as, had, as it has been said before, it must be in a partnership uh, together with them to learn from each other, inspire each other. Um, I go off script a little bit, but uh, this might be interesting. We had a retreat uh, a few months ago with, with a couple of colleagues from different countries, also from South Korea, by the way, who deal with democracy. And I had a, a very interesting discussion, or we had a very interesting discussion with the colleague from Botswana. The colleague from Botswana told me, you know, your democracy that you invented, it's great, we like it, but we had our own democracy much before you. And this was a very interesting starting point to, to talk about democracy. What does it mean? What does it come from? And especially what I wanted to underline here, how we can learn from each other and inspire uh, each other. It's not about copy-paste the Swiss model. We know this is very specific. It's historically grown and so on. But yes, it is an, an inspiration. I have seen that. I have seen it in Poland. I've seen it in Romania. I have seen it in the US. The Swiss dem the direct democratic model with all its flaws is an inspiration. And we, we should use it. And um, we, we, can, we can use it. What I wanted to say very briefly here also is that showing solidarity with and supporting those who strive for democracy or defend it is, is, is also important. And I think what is, what is important in the discourse also in Switzerland is that supporting democracy abroad has nothing to do with some hopeless idealism um, that we, we believe we have to bring democracy to the world and uh, that's, that's a value in itself. It is obviously a value itself, but in a way the opposite is true because I believe that values are an essential part of an interest-driven and a realistic foreign policy because it is in our interest to have a world where democracy and human rights flourish because it will make us more safe. And I think we should also try to have a more optimistic, principled, and also positive approach, not so much against someone, but for democracy and its undeniable strengths. That's a bit what I said at the very beginning. I'm still optimistic about democracy because of what it entails, what it stands for, um, despite of all the uh, challenges. And one last point, and it has been mentioned a bit by the colleagues here on the panel, Switzerland must also lead by example and with conviction. We have to do our homework here, first and foremost. Yes, it's a great democracy, a lot works great, but we have to continue to work because a democracy is never perfect, and we have to work on it. And we have to lead by example and with conviction. Only then we can convincingly talk about democracy with others. And um, that's what we try to do also as a foreign ministry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, if we are not optimistic about democracy, what should we be uh, optimistic about? It's a big question. Janina. Yeah, well, I, I am a researcher at the Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy. And what we do from the center is to try to work in partnership also with actors from civil society, organizations, etc. We do research, but uh, we try to connect our research to things that matters to the people, and we try to offer solutions, advice on how to proceed after. So this is one, one quite clear way. And this afternoon, we will present in a workshop on youth participation and democratic innovations, climate change, etc., one example of that. 
Uh, and then I also cooperate with media, and I think we haven't spoken much about that, but this is also a challenge. Polarization is a challenge for democracies, and I fully agree um, here with this idea of uh, avoiding to be too pessimistic, and I think we have a responsibility, the, the ones working in the media, on, on not feeding this extreme positions. Polarization is not something new, and conflict is not polarization. So we, we need to distinguish the levels in, in which we are, uh, what we are talking about, because conflict is just part of a democratic system, because we are talking about pluralism. So we have to deal with conflict, not to avoid conflict. And, and to, to have different ideas about something is not polarization. But of course, there is polarization increasing. And I think the media in general is feeding that because there is a system in which to attract the attention of the public. It's a media system also producing bad incentives in this direction. So I think we have a responsibility on that also, trying to separate and identify exactly what we are talking about, what is dangerous, what is just more of the same. I, I, I am from Latin America, and we see it quite often after an election. Of course, there are elections which are really dangerous, like the one coming uh, in Brazil in October the 2nd, with Bolsonaro running again. But then you have many other elections which are uh, um, suggested by the media according to the ideological position as something that will end with the nation and the country and democracy if the other wins. And we are talking about left and right, which of course has an incidence on policy making, but it's not the end of democracy. And if we are not able to distinguish between that, then yes, we, we are feeding the, the, the grass for these authoritarian solutions and to these ideas of everything is the same. I mean, coming from, I was born during a dictatorship, it's not the same. Uh, uh, what we have in Argentina now, for instance, as a democracy, than what we had uh, in the late 70s, it's not the same. So what we have now is not good, but what we, we had before was much worse. And I think this is really important too. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very clear dimensions also, also and differences. And also, chong -ok, you you were born in a dictatorship. <laughs> so first, uh, because uh, I have been in charge of uh, Ministry of Gender Equality and Family, uh, the women's work uh, have been uh, supported the social system uh, in behind the screen. So uh, like that, many of unpaid work and the unpaid sacrifices uh, uh, have uh, sustained the democracy. So I want to make sure uh, that uh, democracy is, uh, is like a, a family work and a nurturing baby. So it should be taken care of. So, but uh, usually the democracy activists and the democracy promoters uh, do it uh, with their own some kind of uh, sacrifices. So, so it, it should be socially recognizable. Uh, that part is the very important part uh, within society. So to try to create an institutional basis for those kind of people uh, to work uh, more effectively. So that, that is one thing I want to share. And second is usually in this kind of a, uh, developing stage of democracy, usually uh, the value was not implanted firmly, and usually the procedure process were imported and uh, copied by others. Uh, because of that, when the, demo uh, the system of democracy cannot deliver something, cannot, uh, cannot uh, be effective in problem solving, then the, uh, the tool of democracy are easily uh, replaceable. So in that sense, uh, a democracy uh, should be accepted as a value uh, because well, when it is closely related with the human right and the dignity, then it cannot be erasable and replaceable by the functional uh, efficiency or something. That is the uh, that is clearly uh, bear in mind in uh, developing democratizing countries. So. So in that sense, uh, uh, because uh, 
uh, in we uh, we don't know we are but but very similar generation we see the main, we see the tragic of uh, mis decision making so in that sense we are morally obliged to defend the democracy in some way but the young generation uh, they are uh, they are uh, some kind of uh, mm, a little bit free rider in that sense. So uh, they, 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 they are more encroached by the commercialized, uh, uh, atomized individualism. In that sense, uh, uh, some kind of a more early socialization of uh, public value is uh, uh, in need for uh, uh, restoring and uh, defending democracy. And uh, so, uh, so we, we, we will try to say the how the morally and uh, in human, uh, human base, the, the free riding is not good uh, in certain ways. So for that, uh, we need some kind of, for the young people especially, uh, they are more efficiency-oriented uh, atmosphere. So we, we, we provide some incentive for their participation. So, and uh, let them feel the, some kind of achievement through participation. So try to invent a certain system uh, for, for them to be part of this society and uh, uh, this kind of more uh, long-term and future-oriented public activities is, uh, uh, is uh, the very integral part of their own uh, uh, some kind of uh, gr growth. So uh, that, that is the, uh, that kind of system should be in invented. So uh, finally, uh, because uh, we have, uh, there are many international institutions uh, like uh, OECD and uh, some kind of uh, development agency, but uh, those kind of development agency are more targeted on development, economic development. But uh, we all know there are uh, from mm, 2015, so we, we from UN system, we uh, adopted uh, sustainable development goals. So uh, under the reflection that uh, economic development uh, uh, may not uh, some kind of effective in uh, in inducing real development. So uh, inequality and the good governance and uh, some kind of a democratization is the tool to get over uh, all the problems uh, within this uh, global community. So in that sense, more, more resources should be on the, uh, in foreign aid, so on the issue of uh, human rights and the democracy. But uh, uh, many governments uh, are very reluctant to run into uh, that troublesome area. So, uh, so the economic development resources uh, uh, or con construction related issue uh, very easily get consensus, but uh, on the issue of uh, human rights and the democratic assistance is still very debatable. So for that, we should make a certain uh, opinion. So in glo global for through global forum. So finally, uh, so in this kind of gathering, so uh, there are many uh, the non-European um, activists who who fighting for their own democracy. So later on, maybe some of our responsibility to support them to be here. So that was the uh, one point we should go. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, taking responsibility for democracy and getting the opportunity to taking responsibility. I think it's for every generation a new challenge and a new task. And uh, obviously also here, we can learn a lot from each another. Uh, Linda, you, uh, you are the head of democracy at Mercator Foundation, and that's possible the newest add to this kind of support structure. Tell us a little bit what you are doing concretely. Yes, I'd love to. Thank you very much. Um, so. Within this program that we're having that we just started in January, uh, we have three focuses and I actually already get, went a little bit into them. Um, so we have this making people able and willing to participate, then 
ensuring informed and enlightened citizenship and create the sense of togetherness. And there I said I wanted to go a little bit deeper down. But first, I might just briefly say something on not only how, but also who should support um, democracy and its development a little bit more. And as you said, I'm talking to you with the head of foundations. And in this regard, I have three things. I have, you, you see, I like lists of three. Uh, I have a call, I have a wish, and I have an idea. And the call is towards foundations. Foundations usually don't go into the topic of democracy because they think it's too political. And I want to call out to each and every foundation, whoever representative might be here, it has nothing to do with being too political. It has to be, it has something to do with defending our fundamental rights and our freedoms. And I think that should be something that everyone should care about. That's my call. <laughs> then I have a wish. My wish is towards big companies. Simon, you also said it, right? The private sector. We have seen at the 24th of February, company after company pulling out of Russia. Why? Because they don't support a dictatorship. They want to support democracies because they rely on being in stable states. They rely on working in democracies. And I would like to ask them to take responsibilities for the democracy that they rely on and stop undermining them. Stop acting against the stop acting against the societies that you rely on just to make profit. That's my wish that might come true one day. <laughs> And then I have an idea. And the idea relies on something that Janine already said and um, that you also, Simon, said, that democracy is often taken as a given. You know, we think it's, it's just there. And people can come to events and put up cardboards with their opinions when they think it's amazing what we get when we have democracies. We just sometimes tend to forget all the benefits that democracies give us. And therefore, um, the other day, I just talked with a friend and we kind of got into the weird idea of thinking about how we could urbanize Switzerland, so big little urbans, and think about how we could just little by little corrupt the system in order to get from a functioning democracy to a completely undemocratic system. And we found loopholes that we had never thought about. And it was super interesting to do that. What am I trying to say with this? I don't want you to be little Orbans, but um, actually to tune into your dystopic or utopic minds helps to connect to creativity, to imagination, to fantasy. And I just want to encourage you all to use the swarm intelligence that you have here and also in other events or with your friends and colleagues and to think different, think in different ways, just turn around and think to look at it at a problem in a completely different view and think beyond. And you know, maybe in this way we can find new solutions, we can find new ideals, we can find new visions of the democracies we're going to live in. And I'm sure that even just by a little together we can strengthen the democratic foundation that we want to build the future on. Thank you very much. Um this is uh, an invitation, uh, one can really say, to, uh, to, um, to think and to work and to share. I mean, uh, allow me one remark, maybe it's better that there are many little Orbans than a few big ones. Now, uh, we have heard so much of, uh, let's say, also concrete uh, ideas, works. I mean, I'm very impressed, and I must say, during the last 15 years, I have been more and more impressed how many people, how many institutions, how many governments have started to take this democracy development and support work much more serious. And of course it's necessary, but it's not self-evident again. It needs people like you, it needs people who are engaged to make it happen because otherwise it's just, it's just there and nobody really cares. And that's the biggest problem, the ignorance about these issues. And of course, here in this room at the Global Forum, we are people who are really committed, who are engaged, who are uh, investing a lot of our time, resources to make a change and to invest into democracy. And investing into democracy is like investing into infrastructure at large. It's, it's 
we are building uh, streets, we are building, uh, 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 we, are, we are buying air fighters, or whatever. But investing in democracy is at least as important as all those other things. And that's so encouraging to hear you, to hear, uh, uh, to hear these ideas, these, these projects, these lifelong works. Thank you for your participation, for your sharing, for your support also to the Global Forum. This, uh, in my view, was a start really entering this hard working day. And this is the Global Forum, so let's go forward. Thank you.